Simone de Beauvoir was a pioneer for the second wave feminist movement and one of the most famous philosophers to have lived. Strikingly, de Beauvoir did not label herself as a philosopher, since she never attempted to provide an original treatise which aimed to fully encapsulate the truth of the world or the human condition. Instead, she considered herself a writer, a commentator, and a novelist. Beauvoir's identification should not, however, discredit her as a philosopher. Jean-Paul Sartre's work on existentialism is heavily indebted to de Beauvoir's careful eye and scholarly expertise, and her book, The Ethics of Ambiguity, is considered by many as one of the greatest texts in moral philosophy and existentialism, the ethical text which Sartre promised but never produced. Simone de Beauvoir's most famous original text, though, is The Second Sex, a detailed examination of what it means to be a woman through the lens of existentialism. The Second Sex was highly controversial at the time of its publication, receiving backlash from certain areas of a male-dominated academia and the press. Nevertheless, it is still considered one of the greatest works in feminist philosophy. We hope to keep producing the show far into the future, bringing you all your regular weekly dosage of philosophy. We get a real kick out of making the show for you all, and we are really happy with how far we've come. Please take a moment to consider supporting the show and donating via our Patreon page. The upkeep editing and maintenance of the show is a lot of work and a lot of money too if you support the show you get pre-releases of all the episodes your after show and access to the canteen cafe any donation you pledge keeps the show going thank you this episode in part one we're going to be looking at the life of simone de beauvoir in part two we'll be discussing the ethics of ambiguity in part three we'll be jumping into the second sex and finally in part four we'll be engaging in some further analysis and discussion. Bonjour and welcome to episode 51 of the Pan Psycast. Bonjour, je m'appelle Jacques Symes. Bonjour, the dutiful Monsieur Andrew Horton. <laughs> Bonjour. Bonjour, the ambiguous Monsieur Oli Mali. Bonjour, Monsieur. Um, so that exhausts all of our French, by the way. <laughs> so uh, if, if you were impressed, don't be. <laughs> it's been a long time since we've all been in a room together, hasn't it? It's been a while. Uh, we, we were looking at this earlier, and I, I believe that it was back in March or maybe May when we did the religious language episode. Because mm. anything since then, it's been uh, either Phoebe's been helping us out or it's been interviews with some great philosophers. So uh, if you've been yearning for just a bit of the three of us which may <laughs> yearning for yeah. the three of us <laughs> then that, that's what you've missed you've missed yeah. things like that you've missed said. ridiculous sayings and uh, <laughs> just incomprehensible gibberish then you're in the right place today i'm very excited about this episode i think it's been a long time since we've had a classic pan cast episode and it's on a topic that we've been promising to deliver for what feels like forever. Yeah, when was it? When we did our first existentialism yeah, yeah. series? Since when we started doing Kierkegaard, Sartre and Camus, uh, we mentioned Beauvoir quite a few times and then now fulfilling our promise. Yeah, yeah, we mentioned lots of times, didn't we? We were like, oh, we should really do an episode on Simone de Beauvoir and we should really, you know, give her, her true justice. Uh, and now is that time. The time has come. Right. To... It's about 34 episodes ago. <laughs> well, <laughs> sure. We keep well... our promises. We get emails from people saying, can you do this? Can you do that and we say we'll do them eventually and by that we mean 34 <laughs> episodes in the future but eventually has come and uh, today we shall be doing yeah. some under before it's gonna be fantastic well as you both know when we mm -hmm. haven't seen each other for a while we all try and grow massive beards sure and you've done an excellent job on yours jack <laughs> i must say <laughs> what do you think Does, is it a keeper or i mean, I mean there's was, not much to keep jack so <laughs> <laughs> well, i was reading the second sex and i thought you know what i just need to be more manly and live up to the ideal form. Sure, that's the that, that was, was the, the main away. message. You, that was your main message you yeah. got from that book. Yeah. No, I mean, as as somebody who's looking at two people with beards, uh, Ollie, yours is far superior. If I Thanks, may Andy. say so myself, it's not a competition. <laughs> <laughs> but if it was, but if it was, I'd win. <laughs> if it was, you'd win. <laughs> Depends what the criteria was for grading said. Beard, right, but sure. Good thing beard doesn't, you know, just imply knowledge and wisdom. No. It's a very good but thing. But it's fun it to stroke your beard while you, uh, contemplate, while you contemplate, contemplate yeah. important philosophical most philosoph things. Well, well, most male philosophers anyway always have, you know, some form of ecstatic facial hair, shall we say. So they I do. think we should continue that uh, that tradition. But are we trying to you know, live up to this expectation? It is one... One is not born a philosopher, one becomes a philosopher, right? So I see these people with beards and I try and grow one and fail. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> okay, let's leave that. Right. Last time I try and do that. Um, so 
We've um, been lucky enough to be invested by Cullen and Gabriels, who have made a donation yes. to the show. Um, we've got some new equipment, which hopefully you can hear the improvement in the audio quality already. Um, guys, message for Cullum's? Just a massive thank you. Uh, it's incredible that there are people willing to invest in us, and hopefully we will repay that back with some excellent content uh, that they'll be proud of as well as our listeners. So thank you again. That's uh, very generous. Yeah, it's just fantastic to see that, you know, we're all the all the money that they kindly donated to us, we're putting back into the podcast so you guys get the benefit from it. It's not going to expensive holidays in, the, in you know, the Mediterranean, unfortunately. <laughs> it's going towards the equipment for the podcast. It's for the benefit of the listeners um, and investing in the future of the podcast, which we hope mm. we can do for as long as possible. Um, and, yeah, it's just fantastic. It's great to have some new equipment and hopefully the, there'll be a great result from that and it will give us a bit more freedom um, and just, you know, like, like I said, it's just fantastic that uh, we have that amazing opportunity yeah and and just for listeners who are concerned um if you might be nothing's going to change they've asked us to do the exact same thing as before they're just helping us with equipment we're traveling to meet guests we're paying their fares and studio hire when we're out on the road um so that's what it's going towards but it's just more of the exact same and we want to bring you some more of these informal discussions i think we've missed these as well as a group we want to get back together enjoy ourselves have a laugh and study a philosopher and, and do that in some real depth and we best hurry up because i've got a holiday in the mediterranean to get to. <laughs> yeah, yeah. um jumpers um sweatshirts rather you know what not everyone calls them jumpers yeah i think the uh, sweatshirts i mean i might be wrong about this but that sounds more american yeah. um i say jumper i like a good jumper jack but no one in like if it was cold in america and i said can i have a jumper no one would understand that's not a thing no i mean when you think about the word, it sounds a bit odd. But yeah. do, do, do the but, Europeans use sweatshirt, or do they use? I'm not they sure. Jumper. I looked online, and most shops sell them as sweatshirts. Oh, so or okay. sweaters, sweats they call but, it. Yeah. yeah, yeah. But they wear them like sports. What sports you wear a sweater in? I mean, you might wear them like, like jogging outside, like, maybe. Yeah, or like if you're warming up or something like that, right? Yeah, well, what size are you guys? Uh, I'll t- <laughs> yeah. If listeners have not seen me, I'll take a triple XL. <laughs> it's been a while. <laughs> yeah. uh, no, uh, like I usually go for a medium. Jack. Me- and medium's good. Jack. Well, thank you. I'm going to grab your jumpers now. Actually, oh, great. you wow. two want to just have some general chit chat as I cool. grab them out. Sure. Man, uh, I'm really looking forward to this. Yeah, there's nothing better than being sat in a room with we've all had, these uh, We've had mugs, we've had t-shirts, but the one thing I, I like, and I think anybody who knows me could attest to this, is I wear a lot of jumpers. So this will not, this will not go amiss. I'll be wearing this probably too much, and it will oh, wow. This is, needs this is to be great. changing. Wow, it I comes with extra stuff. You well, see. yeah, so I thought you'd unpack them on mic just to explain what you've got in front okay, of you. So okay. We've got some hand sidecast leaflets, which I just strategically lay around public places to spread the message. <laughs> I've got some promotional little... Uh, uh, little card posters here. You've got your own unique, lovely. You've got your own unique stickers, so you can take them off and use them again. You know, because you, you can make any jumper a pan side cast jumper. Don't say that. Sweatshirt. <laughs> uh, it, it kind of, it's got yeah, some nice stickers. I must say, Jack, the folding is not that great. Oh. <laughs> <laughs> wow, look at this. This is great. Ooh, it's got a big logo on the back. I like that. I'm going to put this on. Uh, well. Um, it's the panpsychast.com forward slash sweatshirts if you're uh, if you've been sold by Andrews and Ollie's pitch <laughs> <laughs> yeah well Jack this is great sorry that was really loud into the mic uh, Anvil uh, ooh 70% cotton that's lovely that's nice and soft uh, it's really soft I wonder what it? the other thing on the inside is. there oh that is yeah that's very nice it's beautiful mm. aren't they right put them on uh, then in, in, all, in all seriousness and not just selling this because it's our stuff <laughs> but, uh, the, but the, the logo comes out really nicely on the back uh, and the the front is understated but nice, and it's the type of thing that I'm I'm not usually one to wear things with giant logos on, um, but when it's, it's your own logo, <laughs> <laughs> yeah. but when it strokes my ego, <laughs> I'll do it. Um, but no, it, it really is. It's, objectively, it's, it's nice. Objectively um, speaking, it's very comfortable. Jack. <laughs> You can't say objectively. <laughs> that was the joke, Andrew. Bloody hell. What's this guy on? The beautiful. Right? So um, just search Pan Psycho Sweatshirts, or there's a link in the iTunes description. Um, once we run out of them, we're going to run out. So if you're listening to this, 50 episodes in the future for an episode 100. Unfortunately, we don't have any anymore. They've all sold out. Um, all the sales go back towards supporting the show, but we're not making a lot on most of the jumpers. Um, it's literally just to give you guys something back. So we've been requested um, some more merch after our T-shirt sold out a while ago about 25 episodes ago. Um, <laughs> so you've got them. 
Uh, Patreon, it's taking a brilliant turn over on Patreon. So we're do, doing a bit of admin here. If it's yeah. the first time for you listening to the show, it's been a while. So we're celebrating episode 50 really here, aren't we? So it's like Christmas for us. So, yeah. Yeah. Wow. <laughs> Thanks, Dad. I've always wanted a pants like us jumper or a sweatshirt. Yeah. <laughs> There'll be some Freudian stuff going on here of Jack's your dad. Yeah. Yeah, that's getting a bit weird. <laughs> um, it, the, the after show is taking a good turn, isn't it? We're doing uh, things that make you go, hmm. Mm. It's very different. Uh, please support us on Patreon if you haven't already. Um, the people on Patreon, you're helping us tick over the show. And also you can get access. You can get yourself a jumper on the Patreon now. You can also get yourself a Canteen Cafe, the after show. But all those, we want to keep doing this in, long into the future. And we depend on your support. So thank you to everyone on Patreon already for supporting us. Head over there if you haven't supported us already. Patreon.com forward slash PanPsychast. A long awaited episode on Simone de Beauvoir. Are we looking forward to it? Yes. Uh, I mean, we've already alluded to the fact that we, this is a long time coming. I've really enjoyed doing my reading. Uh, I think with any of the existentialists, they, they just, they're just such good writers. And uh, their, their ideas really kind of pierce through a lot of the things you wish you could say, but uh, you're not a good enough writer to do it. Mm. So, so yeah, I'm, I'm looking forward to this. There's loads of little areas. And then the influence of de Beauvoir is, is huge. Yeah. Um, and the, uh, the amount of stuff we kind of take for granted and, and don't perhaps analyze as carefully as we wish we should, she does it. And uh, it'll be great to kind of unpack those as we go through today. Yeah, I'm incredibly excited for this episode. Um, I think that there's something about, I, I mean, I, I read the whole of the second sex in preparation for this episode, and there's something about that book um, that I just instantly was drawn to. Um, as much as it is a very long book, there's so much in there that is so contemporary um, mm. with things like the Me Too movement and people having very serious discussions about, you know, the the the, the role and nature of gender and sex and men and women. And it's just a, such a fantastic, fantastic topic to really unpick. Um, and I can't wait to just really just dive in and discuss some of the ideas in it because it's, uh, like Andy said, just incredibly influential and existentialists just, just dive straight into human nature like what like mm. what it is to be a human and the human experience and that's one of the main things i like about it it's just about who we are as people um, and that means that anybody can i think connect with it in some sense um, mm. even if some of the ideas are more difficult i think it's you know we're not doing metaphysics we're not doing like epistemology we're looking here at like the human experience and that's yeah. what i'm really interested in what what's uh, existentialism let's define our terms nice and early on existentialism just in a in a sentence but we'll unpack it further and further as we go but existentialism do you want to do you want to take sure this so you it. could say it's a, like a mid 20th century movement mainly european based based around um a kind of a, a, a reaction i guess to world war 2 based around the idea that existence precedes essence. Um, so in, in reaction to a lot of the um, restrictions of, of World War II, especially in France, on key philosophers like Jean-Paul Sartre is seen as the main kind of key figure of existentialism. And he comes up with the idea of, of radical freedom, that we are radically free to choose our destiny, um, to fulfill our, our true authentic selves. Because he believed that most people didn't do that that they kind of just made choices because they felt it was the the best thing to do this is what people in their 30s do this is what people of my gender do this is what people do um whereas he thought that people should live authentically and not live in something called bad faith they should make mm -hmm. authentic choices um and recognize the fact that they have lots of choice and they are radically free yeah and just to jump on that as well uh because when people hear this they i think the immediate backlash is and uh, if you have listened to the bbc in our time episode on simone de beauvoir uh melvin bragg brings this up as well which is okay so we're supposed to be radically free but what are like aren't there all of these things that stop me from being mm. free and uh, and Sartre and de Beauvoir would like yes agree that there is what what they would call facticity which is kind of the the conditions in which you are brought into life like no one chooses the position they're born into uh, and you might have all of these social norms that are expected to live by or or even the norms of your particular sex or like a whole list of things and the and money is also a big factor on this but for Sartre and de Beauvoir that's never enough to say like you can't choose some other path outside of the one that's sort of pre-scripted for you. There is mm. always a choice there to be made uh, and that they're asking you to take responsibility and say, all right, don't, don't just fall into being the, the follower and the person who just lives on autopilot throughout their, 
kind of cookie cutter life. It's it's like st- stand up, look around, think, and act. Uh, C- cookie and cutter life. That sounds nice. Is that your own phrase? No, <laughs> <laughs> no of course it's not. <laughs> Where did you get that from? Cookie cutter life. It's just like it's just you that know that like you know. That, it's a saying, right? Yeah, I think. Yeah, I, like I think it. as well. It's worth saying that they're not necessarily interested in the choices you make necessarily. It's mm. the idea that they should be authentic choices. So if you want to like get married and have kids and have live in a suburban house, that's absolutely fine if that's what you genuinely truly want. Um, but again, they argue that lots of people don't do that. That lots mm. of people just kind of go through life without thinking about it. So like Andy said, minus the cookie cutter, you know. Take some responsibility for your own thinking and what you actually want authentically and and live that life as authentically as you can, which is quite an empowering philosophy for lots Mm. of people. I think that's why it's quite so popular because it's very self-individual focused. You know, you can live the authentic life and make the choices that you you wish, which for a lot of people is very appealing. We highly recommend going back and listening to episodes 16 on Kierkegaard, 17 on Sartre and 18 on Albert Camus. Um, Three, two very big existentialists. Camus does doesn't define himself as an existentialist. Um, well, Kierkegaard doesn't either, but they're all does existentialists. Anybody, does anybody <laughs> yeah, yeah. identify That's as the an problem existentialist? With this, is that, uh, to label oneself. Well, Sartre does. He, it, but I, even then, like... He I, more as a Marxist, really, but by the end of his life, didn't he? Oh, but, <laughs> yeah, so <laughs> like, like, if there's one thing, existentialists don't really like labels. <laughs> yeah. So let's label Not being them. radically free, but uh, as as a joke I said before we started recording, we're now all wearing pan-side-cast jumpers, <laughs> all looking exactly the same, all having now grown some sort of facial hair. We're really doing yes. a great job of being independent, free individuals here, guys. Thank you. That's all I needed. Um, facial hair, you heard it here first. We've all got it. Some of us are more successful than others. <laughs> Um, so, uh, just before we jump into life, so this instalment, this week, we're looking at the life of Simone de Beauvoir. Next week, Ethics of Ambiguity. The week after that, Second Sex. And three weeks' time, we're looking at further analysis and discussion. So, it's a real, real in-depth look at it. We've promised it for a long time. Big listeners' requests. Nice segue into listener questions. Now, just before we get into life, I know this is a bit more admin. And if it's your first time listening to the show, you're thinking, where's the philosophy? But it's coming. Don't worry. Be patient. Um, We've got our listener segment question (laughs) over here. Um, So I will have made a listener segment jingle and it will be played here, presumably. If I haven't, then it's just my voice saying (laughs) this. So we don't want to make fake reactions to this jingle we haven't heard yet. You can, you're more than oh, welcome. Oh, wow, that's really great, Jack. Do you Thanks. like the new jingle, Ollie? Yeah. Meh. <laughs> right, your first question comes from Gilberto Morbach from Brazil. Cool. And he puts his question to Jack in the form, but he says, my question is for any of the hosts, really, so feel free to choose authentically mm-hmm. someone to answer it. Very Ooh, nice. How, how do we choose authentically? We're radically free. It, it's up to you. I think it should be Andy. Yes, yeah. <laughs> very well okay. the question is no that's Thanks. his words very Ooh. well the question is the existentialists talk about existentialism being a humanism about our ethics of ambiguity but given that our existence precedes essence is there any way for a f- existential ethics that is not relativistic can objective values and existentialism coexist or would that be a contradiction in itself Um, So he's talking a bit here, he's saying, just to break it down for listeners, this idea that existence precedes essence. So you're born and then you decide what the meaning is in the world. And if you create it, Gilberto's question is, well, if we're creating meaning, then there's no objective meaning. There's nothing wrong with the Holocaust. You You just impose your own meaning onto that thing. Um, sorry for such a heavy example. Earlier. Right. Um, can I? I'll, yeah, I'm happy to take it. Out and- so I think the the one thing here is to to try and avoid the the potential problem of saying like relative uh, has to mean like ent- entirely subjective, um, and that like it implies some sort of nihilism, which is something that we'll talk about when we when we discuss the ethics of ambiguity, and that really there's nothing wrong with saying that you can't use objective basis from an existentialist point of view. So I'm I'm currently reading a series of essays uh, in, in the form of a book called Neuro Existentialism, uh, and they're they're analysing current neuroscience and then saying like, well, what problems does this raise for the existentialist? Mm. Uh, and that you can you can use the scientific basis of saying right, well, it appears that our brains respond in all sorts of ways. Uh, with different hormones and you know well i'm in really simple terms because i don't want us to get bogged down in this but if we talk about the idea of love 
and like the neurotransmitters uh, of uh, oxytocin. Um, like you can you can look at how we respond to love and how our brains would better be suited to certain moral choices if we follow certain things that neuroscience can tell us, and we can base that upon some sort of objective finding that science has given us, and then say like uh, this might help us. But that's always going to be relative to a particular situation, uh, and that you can you can look at perhaps like creating. Uh, like what would produce these feelings and these mm. nice feelings kind of like a you know utilitarian type of way here but there's nothing to say that you can't act in that way that follows the existentialist point of view and say like there are certain basis on objective value uh, an objective standard of which to place these values just be aware that these values can shift and change in the future right so like it doesn't mean that we fall into complete subjectivity but you, I'm not going to say like suddenly the Nazis can be absolutely right That's, mm. that can't be can't be said that's a that's a really good answer. Uh, thank you for your question, Gilberto. Uh, next question comes from Jim Clare on Patreon. Hey guys, I'm not sure how I stumbled onto your show, but I'm blessed I did. To be completely unstoic, I'm practicing stoic. I'm a practicing stoic. I, do I <laughs> dove in deep to stoicism about two years ago, and it's had a massive impact on my life. Somehow that led me to also become a Schopenhauer fan, minus pushing loud people down the stairs and his, well, unique take on women, which has led nerding out <laughs> to philosophy in general. Since finding your podcast about a month-ish ago, it has already had a massive impact on my life professionally and personally, professionally on asking better questions and seeing different sides and handling tough decisions as well as stoking my desire to write on being a practicing stoic who happens to be an advertising copywriter. On the personal level, <laughs> you guys aided in getting deeper into what it means to be a stoic. Outside of stoicism, you will also show me all types of philosophy which further strengthen a good sense of center with myself. In short, I love that I found your show, plus I love Steven Pinker, so thanks for having him on. If I can be even more unstoic, a request for stoicism or Schopenhauer is on the list. I'd also love to hear your take on new thought, in brackets, Napoleon Hill, manifestation, the flatulence of the secret. Did I say flatulent? Oh, well, my, li <laughs> my line of work is crowded with people who buy hard into it. And I'm curious about your input. You guys rock. Cool. That's a very long <laughs> statement uh, <laughs> with lots of little things. Now, uh, I don't want to speak too much. In First of all, thank you, Jim. Yes, thank, yeah, thank, thank you for the, <laughs> the response. Um, I won't speak long on this. I already gave an answer to the last one. Um, but what, one thing I will say is that uh, I'm very interested in looking at, into more on Schopenhauer. Uh, and Stoicism as a general philosophy is something that I think uh, is worth reading about. Uh, I, in the summer, I read quite a few books around Stoicism and the works of Marcus Aurelius. Like it's just a really great way to kind of center yourself, and yeah, I would li liken it. And the same thing with Schopenhauer is the kind of a lot of Buddhist thought. Um, we want to get into more of that type of stuff. And Ollie, I know that you're a big fan of of that type of mm. philosophy. Yeah, we've talked about that before. Um, we've talked about doing an episode on Schopenhauer. That's definitely on the cards, I think. And I'd love the opportunity to give him a give him a read. Um, I only really know stuff about him in context in Nietzsche, uh, in terms of like the will and stuff like that. But I really want to dive into. Although I've heard a bit of a rumor that he's not necessarily the most positive philosopher no, no, of all he time. Is, uh, <laughs> he's a pessimist. Yes, he's very pessimistic, which I actually would probably quite enjoy reading. Um, yeah. And Stoicism, yeah, absolutely. Stoicism is a fantastic area of philosophy, more in the kind of classical period, which we haven't really gone back to for a while. We've been kind of jumping all over the place um, with, you know, um, the audio book and stuff. But yeah, it'd be great to go back to classical philosophy and do some Stoicism. The ideas of Stoicism are really interesting. And I think a lot of people in the modern day with a, you know, a very chaotic modern life full of loads of inputs, outputs and distractions, I think people are finding actually stoicism to have some very kind of interesting truths to it and the idea of being quite emotionally separate for example from your life in some sense can give a lot of value to people um so yes yeah, we should we should do an episode on stoicism too let's just start writing this long list of episodes we need to <laughs> yeah. do and new thought i'm not sure this this new thought is jim claire and guys any i've no? i've not done enough reading around I, that i spoke area to, to greg on the phone yesterday and i'll uh, asking him as well and i'll mention greg's response to this next question in a moment as well not sure jim can you let us know can you recommend us some reading Reading, perhaps. That's a good idea. Yeah, uh, agreed. And and we'll we'll always happy to pick up and read things that are suggested by listeners. And perhaps if you write this question again, we'll answer it in our next informal discussion. Final question before we get into the life of Simone de Beauvoir. Finley Wilson from Canada. Question for Ollie. Hey guys, thanks for the chance to ask a question. My question is for Ollie or Greg. 
Andy and Jack seem to have ethical views. What are yours? Thank you, Finley. <laughs> now, I spoke to Greg on the phone yesterday. He says he's a divine command theorist who doesn't, <laughs> who doesn't believe in God. <laughs> <laughs> so he thinks he believes in divine commands, but he doesn't believe in God. Great. Uh, that's a good question. I mean, yeah, I mean, ethics is something that we talk about a lot. Um, and we've got a bit of a running joke behind the scenes that obviously Jack is a hedonistic utilitarian at the moment. It's not a joke. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. I mean, Too bad that you, it is swine yeah. morality. You've got a running joke behind yeah, the scenes. Yeah, yeah, yeah. <laughs> Uh, Andy is a uh, obviously a I, Kantian, but I'm um, not though. I'm, but he's not. I'm, yeah, I'm yeah. Not. Uh, and I'm the, and apparently the only one left for me is that I'm a virtue ethicist, um, which I guess is interesting. Um, for myself, <laughs> <laughs> I mean, I'm not, but I guess fine. Um, yeah, for me, ethics is really interesting, and it's something for me that changes a lot. It changes depending on the day. It depends who I'm talking to. Um, I I personally haven't settled down on an ethical outlook yet. Um, maybe I will do in later life. The more reading I do, and the more the more I learn, but. I, I have issues with consequentialism. I don't think you can always predict the, the outcome of an action. I also have real big problems with absolute moral laws as well. I think that, you know, that's just not very uh, modern or mature way of looking at morality. Um, so with both those two things, I'm kind of stuck really. So I might as well just go with situation ethics. So I just think, you know, just do the most loving thing. Uh, and that's the best way to go. Um, and I think actually most people do kind of follow like a somewhat of that. I mean, me and Andy were talking about this yeah, earlier, yeah. just like a second ago, we were talking about most people do generally base a lot of their ethical decisions on emotion. And mm. most of that emotion is like a form of what? Is that what you do? Or, uh, with my ethical decisions. Yeah. How, how do you know right from wrong, Ollie, if you haven't got one of these views? I clearly don't. I'm so, clearly <laughs> just <laughs> saying so much. Yeah. Um, yeah, just a very quick point on that. I mean, like, so it's funny you say that like, me and Jack have ethical views, but like, it, it really is kind of dependent on... Um, sort of how much research I've I've been doing a lot of reading uh, on ethics over the summer in particular and and still up until this point and um, I'm I would never even uh, even when we're talking Kant like I, I'm not a Kantian um, that's a that's a really bad way to label the way I look at ethics in the sense that I would agree with Ollie and say I wouldn't I wouldn't go down the route of absolute. Uh, mm. unchangeable ethics if you listen to our meta ethics episode um i somewhat still defend the idea of uh, objective uh, values that we can we can get and that i'm a strong believer that through more hard work and and kind of science and, and development that our ethics change throughout history um but that doesn't and so i wouldn't go certainly wouldn't go down complete subjectivism Wonderful. Let's jump into the life of Simone de Beauvoir. Um, thank you for all your questions. It's thepansycast.com forward slash questions if you have a question for us in the future. Um, thank you all. Thanks. Thank you. Part one, the life of Simone de Beauvoir. Right, the life of Simone de Beauvoir, before we get into her ethics of ambiguity in the second sex, her main philosophical texts, we're going to look at her life and see who the person is behind the book. Um, so, who was Simone de Beauvoir? Jack, Ollie and Andy. Investigate. Oh, it feels good to have that jingle mm. back, doesn't it? Ooh. <laughs> Se I've sexy. Literally, I've literally got tingles going down I mean, that, right that now. has been a while. Um, I wanted to kick off this section with a quote from the first part of her uh, book, Memoirs of a Dutiful Daughter. This book, I can't recommend it highly enough. It is, it's so brilliant to read. I think when you've, we've all read uh, Ethics of Ambiguity, Olive went through second sex with a fine tooth comb. And when we've been speaking with each other in anticipation for the episode, we've all been saying like, wow, like it's send, it lit, all jokes aside, it gives you shivers like reading some of these passages. And I haven't been moved by text like this for such a long time, reading them, literally feeling emotion flowing through me from some of the powerful ways that she writes. Uh, we we will be quoting from a quite a bit throughout this four part series, but hopefully you'll see why. This isn't the best example. This is just the start of a life, <laughs> but it's in her words. So this one might not send you shivers. <laughs> I was born at four o'clock in the morning on the 9th of January, 1908, in a room fitted with white enameled furniture and overlooking the Boulevard Raspail. In the family photographs taken the following summer can be seen ladies in long dresses and ostrich feather hats and gentlemen wearing boaters and panamas, all smiling at a baby. They were my parents, my grandfather, uncles, aunts, and the baby is me. What a nice way to start off. 
Well, she starts her memoirs. Yeah, I I remember my birth very vividly too. So that's cool. (laughs) Talk to your therapist about that. (laughs) Okay, dad. Uh, Wait, what? Um, Yeah, so uh, her dates then. Uh, So uh, born in 1908 and then died in 1986. Let's do everything in between. So born in Paris in 1908. Uh, a father, a uh, parents. Do we know anything about our parents? Do we unpack some about about her family life. Sure. So Simone de Beauvoir's mother, we can start with. So her mother was a very religious lady. She was a, a Roman Catholic, uh, and definitely wanted to instill this Roman Catholicism in her children, which is interesting because her dad was actually an atheist as well. So we've got a bit of a already we've got a bit of a, a bit of a family tension here. Obviously, if you're in part of an interfaith marriage. Um, you know, the decision of how to raise your children can be quite a tricky one for a lot of parents. Simone de Beauvoir's attitude towards religion is something that we'll refer to as we kind of go on. She had very strong attitudes towards it, a very strong distaste towards it. And I'm guessing that Memoirs of a Dutiful Daughter is a title of her autobiography is a little bit of a, maybe a little bit of a, a jab there slightly in terms of she didn't unnecessarily fulfill what her mother wanted her to do. Mm, and there's, there's some brilliant passages on her atheism and such. I think there's one here about her mom. Uh, I'll read this passage as well. So in terms of her mom, uh, page nine from Memoirs of a Dutiful Daughter. I was generally generally spared this sort of disappointment. At home, the slightest incident became the subject of vast discussions. My stories were listened to with lavish attention, and my witticisms were widely circulated. Grandparents, uncles, aunts, cousins, and a host of other relatives guaranteed my continuing importance. In addition, a whole race of supernatural beings were forever bent over me. I was given to understand, in attitudes of divine solitude, as soon as I could walk, Mama had taken me to church. She had shown me, in wax, in plaster, and paintings on the wall, portraits of the child Jesus, of God the Father, of the Virgin, and of the angels, of which, like Louise, was assigned exclusively to my service. My heaven was constellated with a myriad benevolent eyes. Uh, Louise is is a carer, is the lady who looked after her um, when she was growing up. Yeah, it might be worth just popping in on that as well, which is, um, and, and it kind of that passage even in itself kind of alludes to it. That is, uh, she came from a, a bourgeois family, um, a very kind of well off, middle class French family. And, and she had, all things considered, a really lovely childhood. Um, and she couldn't really ask for much more. And she describes being like almost amazingly over optimistic and happy throughout her, her childhood, which is somewhat. Uh, ironic in the sense that by the time she becomes a teenager, uh, she, there's definitely a lot more angst there. Um, and then when we when we get to her sort of friendship with Maurice Malou Ponty, uh, she kind of resented him for being so lovely and nice um, because she couldn't help but see the world in a bit more of a kind of cynical way. Yeah, so I guess if we if we kind of take the the Beauvoir family, we've got the the birth of her sister two years after Simone uh, Helen. And I think that it's worth saying that Simone de Beauvoir's family was quite a matriarchal family. So when I say matriarchal, I mean woman-centered, woman-focused. Right. Um, the, the influence of Simone de Beauvoir's father is there, but um, Simone de Beauvoir's family were quite financially independent of, of their father. And they were quite, like Andy said, quite a rich family. Um, and that it's... This is connected to stuff we'll talk about later on where we can kind of see in her childhood the, the maybe the, the roots of the idea that uh, women can be self-sufficient um, mm. and they don't necessarily need to be always following the instructions or ex- or following the expectations of men. Um, and I think this is something we can trace back to her childhood and it's something that really, really pops up in The Second Sex, which we'll be looking at shortly. Um, Helen's a, a brilliant painter as well, I might add. I highly recommend. We'll put a link on the on the website, some of her paintings. She's inspired by uh, feminist philosophy and so on. So I highly recommend looking at some of her work. Yeah, um, I, we don't want to get too bogged down with loads of elements of uh, family life, but I believe one thing that is quite striking uh, and maybe shapes a lot of kind of where she saw herself going was uh, we mentioned that when she was young, she was very beneficial to have you know a decent amount of money and she was always quite comfortable. Um, but her dad ended up losing his job and they didn't actually, eventually they got, got to a point where they weren't going to have a lot of money. And one of the things he was very afraid of is the, of, because of having daughters was is that to get married, you would need to pay a dowry. And he he was kind of always a bit anxious or nervous about the fact that they wouldn't be able to pay a significant dowry or any dowry um, for, for his daughters to get married. So he kind of heavily 
invested uh, and, and, and said to them, look, you're going to need to work. You're going to need to actually go out into the world and do something. And I think that actually appealed quite a lot to uh, Simone. And uh, so she, she really sort of focused on our academia and excelled greatly at it. And uh, I think maybe that kind of pushed her even further, that kind of sense of she would have needed to be independent anyway. Mm -hmm. And with the, you know, the World War One. Obviously, in World War Two, this is a time when, you know, a lot of women were being uh, pushed into factories to work and that, you know, the whole idea of women's liberation, a lot of feminists argue is, is very much connected to technology and connected to those world wars. I mean, those world wars were horrific. But in terms of women's rights, you know, you could argue that in some senses, women were able to prove that, yeah, they could they could work the factories the same as a man. They could intellectually meet men. Um, and this is definitely worth mentioning as well, that as Simone de Beauvoir is growing up, she's seeing all these things happen around her and had a massive impact on her as she grew up too. Um, I want to mention one more thing from her early life, which I think is going to flow through, through the ethics of ambiguity and the second sex section. As Andrew mentioned a moment ago, uh, and he said something, she, you know, she had this very sheltered life. And there's a nice quotation on page 11 here, um, which is going to flow into my point. Sheltered, petted and constantly entertained by the endless novelty of life. I was a madly gay little girl. Nevertheless, there must have been something wrong somewhere. I had fits of rage during which my face turned purple and I would fall to the ground in conversations. I used to howl so loudly and so long that in Luxembourg Gardens I was sometimes looked upon as a child martyr by benevolent and misinformed nursemaids and mothers. Poor little thing, cried one lady, offering me a sweet. All the thanks she got from me was a kick in the shins. <laughs> um, on the next page, she said, What I resented was that some casual phrase beginning, You must, you mustn't, could ruin all my plans and poison my happiness. The arbitrary nature of the orders and prohibitions against which I beat unveiling fists was to my mind proof of their inconsistency. Yes, I appealed a peach, and then why shouldn't I appeal a plum? Why must I stop playing just at that particular moment? It seemed to be confronted everywhere by force, never by necessity. That will become clear as we go, hopefully, this limitation on her freedom. And she'd have these fits of rage as a child trying to uh, fight against it. In the memoirs, she pinpoints three key events that shape her life. These are her relationship with her friend Zaza, uh, receiving a degree in philosophy, and her relationship with Jean-Paul Sartre. Um, so that's the first one, Zaza. So she attended, attended a Catholic school, as uh, Ollie mentioned, her mother was a Catholic. She attended a Catholic school for girls where she met her friend Elizabeth, who she nicknamed Zaza. Obviously, uh, Simone de Beauvoir was deeply religious at the time, and, and she recalls wanting to teach philosophy from an early age in the memoirs. Now, Zaza was... There's a quote in the memoir somewhere, Zaza saying, it would be just as good to raise a family of nine children as it would to do a degree and teach philosophy. And to Simone, this flew in the face of what she thought. She thought that Zaza was under pressure by her parents. Uh, Zaza was being pressured into an arranged marriage, um, yet she fell in love with somebody else. Yeah, so that's that's the relationship. I, I mentioned Maurice Molo Ponti earlier. Um, he he is one of the other sort of great thinkers of this time, and and is remembered because of the relationship and friendship that he had with de Beauvoir as well as Sartre, and, and sort of certainly part of that circle of intellectuals in Paris at the time. Uh, and before he met Elizabeth or Zaza, there was kind of a bit of flirtation between himself and Simone. And there's a couple of accounts where uh, Simone de Beauvoir kind of it really likes this guy he is but he's like the embodiment of this bourgeoisie um he he just seems to be really comfortable in that environment uh, and is a very slick uh talker and and it's just a, like a lovely guy uh, and she really respects him for that but there's that barrier that i think when she meets people like sartre who might have a bit more of an edge to him she certainly uh, finds that more appealing um bazaza does seem to find Melu Ponty uh, exactly the type of person that she she does like, and they they strike off a relationship. Everything appears to be going well, and then out of the blue, he cuts off the relationship with Elizabeth, and it only becomes apparent afterwards that her mother has stepped in and told him, um, "If you don't 
if you don't back away, I'm going to reveal a secret about your own mother, which is that uh, she had had a child outside of her marriage, and that one of one of his siblings was actually uh, not born of his father. Uh, and so there was this big scandal involved, and obviously he backed away. Uh, Simone de Beauvoir always felt like this. she had this deep kind of hatred for the bourgeois ethics of this kind of appearing to be all ethical and high and mighty, uh, but actually there's all this scandal going on in the background. And she highly resented this type of thing. And to the modern ears, that just sounds like any kind of story in your average soap or any kind of dramatic <laughs> love story, right? But what's really interesting about this time is that arranged marriage, specifically in France, is still a very big mm. deal. Marriage isn't for love yet. Um, some people argue even today, not not always. Um, people got married to improve their own social standings. So you wouldn't go into the street and find a beautiful person that you'd want to fall in love with and marry. Your parents and the parents of somebody else would find you a partner that would be the most appropriate for you. They'd be probably a very similar class to you or you should be or you'd be attempting to marry someone of a class higher than you um, and someone that they believe would be the best fit for them someone who could give a you know a, the largest dowry that'd be a very important part of it mm. and you know marriage and relationships weren't based on personal desire they were based on a very cold calculated kind of social structure and standing and here we can definitely see the disadvantages of that, right? We've got this really kind of horrible blackmail-esque story happening um, and with when people's feelings are involved. And for someone like Zaza and Simone de Beauvoir watching her friend go through all of this turmoil and kind of uh, just, you know, horrific selfish action, I think that definitely had a big influence on de Beauvoir, especially mm. with regards to her attitude towards marriage. Um, worth saying that she never married throughout her life and she had very strong opinions on marriage too. Well, the story gets worse, Ollie, as you know, and um, it, she finishes the memoirs, the final three paragraphs of the memoirs. And we're going to finish the story of Zaza here with this quotation. I'm going to give this last extended quotation. I'm in, in danger of breaching the copyright laws of memoirs of a useful <laughs> daughter of the straight. So it'll be my last one. But you can see why I want to quote it directly. So leading up to, this is my own word still, leading up to this passage, uh, four days prior to writing to the events I'm about to say, um, Zaza was admitted to hospital. During the next four days in the clinic at St. Cloud, she kept calling out for my violin, Pardel, Simone, Champagne. The fever did not abate. Her mother had the right to spend the final night with her. Zaza recognized her and knew then that she was going to die. Don't cry for me, Mama Darling, she said. There are outcasts in all families. I'm the outcast in ours. When next I saw her in the chapel at the clinic, she was laid on a bier surrounded by candles and flowers. She was wearing a long nightdress of rough cloth. Her hair had grown and now hung stiffly around a yellow face that was thin. I hardly recognised her. The hands with their long pale fingernails were folded on the crucifix and seemed as fragile as an ancient mummy's. Madame Marbille was sobbing. We have only been instruments in God's hands, Monsieur Marbille told her. The doctors called it meningitis, encephalitis. No one was quite sure. Had it been a contagious disease or an accident? Or had Zaza succumbed to exhaustion and anxiety? She had often appeared to me at night, her face all yellow under a pink sunbonnet and seeming to gaze reproachfully at me. We had fought together against the revolting fate that had lain ahead of us. And for a long time, I believed that I had paid for my own freedom with her death. Ooh, nice, heavy, cheery stuff to start the episode yeah just um just to add a little bit to this um so in uh, sarah bakewell's brilliant book the existentialist cafe she she kind of talks about this whole story as well um and she says that uh this is adding to the kind of the feeling of this so there's no causal connection so zaza died at the age of 21 so still very young her whole life ahead of her um and saying that no causal connection between the two disasters um as in like the taking away of the marriage or the like or the potential relationship with Milu Ponti and this this thing but she she felt like there was and it says that Beauvoir always thought that bourgeois hypocrisy had killed her friend she felt like all of this extra stress of of what her mother was putting her through was actually the thing that really got to her in the end um it's hard to say. I mean, it's it's one of those ones. I'm sure it didn't help, but um, it certainly adds a feeling to put, like her partic why she felt so strongly about this uh, and and why she kind of rejected the life that she had been brought up in. 
Uh, the second big thing is uh, receiving a degree in philosophy. Andrew, you said at the start of the episode in the introduction, uh, way earlier on now in the episode, that um, Simone de Beauvoir didn't see herself as a philosopher. Um, she saw herself as a novelist, etc. Do you want to? What we? What did you mean? <laughs> well, uh, well, I mean, it, so but, well, first of all, she she trained in in writing sort of English and she did maths for a while as well. Um, when she was like becoming uh, more of an academic, she purposely went into philosophy when she reached university. Um, but even when she studied that and when she began to write her own books, it was very much novels that she was interested in. And while she befriended befriended Sartre, who was the philosopher. Mm. Um, she didn't see herself in that role. Sartre produced uh, you know, his, his great works, Being, Being a Nothingness, and, and all the other works of existentialism that derived from that work. She helped extensively with that. Um, she, she, to a point, kind of, um, from what I was reading about her influence on her, his book, Nausea, um, she really kind of made that a whole lot better than I think the original version was going to be. Mm. So let's let's not pretend like she wasn't making a great impact in this area of philosophy. Wasn't Sartre but, in prison at one point and she was like, he was sending her parts back and she was compiling them all? Is this for being in nothingness maybe? Uh, I don't know if it is for that one, but uh, yeah, she she was she was always, they were always sending drafts of work and rereading. Um, and yes, that that is certainly one of the things she did while, while he was in prison. So yeah, a, I think to discredit her as a philosopher is, is ridiculous, even if she didn't want to label herself as such. The Ethics of Ambiguity and The Second Sex that we're looking at are both excellent works of philosophy. Um, and in, in philosophy in the way that we often talk about on the show, which is it, philosophy ties so many other areas of work together. And you can have a great philosophical novel. Um, there's no reason why you can't. Existentialism lends itself perfectly to that mode. So uh, yeah, definitely a philosopher in my eyes. And I think a lot of her works, you know, even her her big, more philosophical texts like The Second Sex has tons of literature in it, loads of literary references, references to poets and writers and lots of sociology and psychology and lots of other biology and loads of fields connected to it. So I think it's a bit unfair to say that Simone de Beauvoir is not a philosopher just because she may not fit the same definition as philosophers that came before her or came mm. after her. You know, we, we, we have to understand that, you know, we always talk about philosophy as philosophy, philosophy gives you permission to kind of dabble in other fields and mm -hmm. that she's doing exactly that she's taking you know if we take the second sex she's taking the most up-to-date biology the most up-to-date psychology and sociology and applying it to her the philosophy that she's kind of writing um, and that's surely the the mark of a good philosopher looking at what's going on around you and having it affect your work yeah i'll, I'll paraphrase from a prime of a life um her book in uh, 1960 she says she's not a philosopher, I guess, for the same points we've just spoken about, that she's not creating this grand philosophical system. Um, and she didn't feel like she needed to to, to be considered a philosopher. Um, so she uh, went to Catholic school. Um, remarkable, at the age of 21, she uh, became the youngest person to become a teacher of philosophy in France. This is leading up to meeting Sartre. This is exciting stuff. Yeah, I mean, it, 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 just to, she's just academically very clever. It's just worth saying, right, that she's an incredibly intelligent, independent young woman at this point. Mm. And that she's obviously got a real thirst for uh, writing, especially writing philosophy, writing novels. She's got lots of ideas. Obviously, meeting John Paul Sartre um, at university as well. Um, they had a massive influence on each other, like we've said, um, reading each other's work, redrafting it. They actually um, were the top two um, kind of people who got the highest mark in one of the most important kind of mm. French exams at the time as well, which was seen as a, a very, very big deal. And, you know, and, and, a, and a, just a wonderful personal accomplishment for herself, you know, that she is, she is not a, a woman that is defined by men in her own way. She, she's definitely kind of forging her own destiny um, and is not necessarily doing what society would expect maybe a woman of her age to do. Um, definitely connected to this existentialism. You know, we mentioned that, you know, John Paul Sartre and de Beauvoir had a very long, lifelong relationship, but they never lived together. Um, they never got married. Um, they were, you know, polyamorous. They used to kind of sleep with other people. So Bernard de Beauvoir herself was bisexual as well. So 
Again, she's kind of living a very alternative lifestyle, I guess we could say, especially for the 1940s and, and 30s. Those forms of lifestyles today are much more accepted than they were back then. So when when she passed the exam, like you say, she came second only behind Sartre. Um, and Sartre was friends with uh, Paul Nizan and uh, René Mayer. I believe I'm pronouncing those correctly. Um, French people, please let me know. Otherwise, <laughs> yeah. um, you can find me on Twitter. Um, <laughs> so, yeah, t- and, um, she struck a friendship with Mayer and he invited her along to the study group uh, where she met Sartre. And she recalls in her memoirs how worried she was the night before going mm. to meet them. Like she said, she revised like for meeting them like she would like a, an exam. She'd never worked harder. And uh, he fell in love with her. She was very beautiful and incredibly intelligent. And Sartre fell head over heels for her. And they agreed to this kind of contract, didn't they? That they would, uh, like you say, they, uh, they'd they keep an open relationship um, to maintain their own freedom yet still have this loving uh, friendship with each other. So they remained very close until Sartre's death in in 1980. And uh, a farewell to Sartre, uh, one of her last books, I think it is her last book, actually. um, She she writes this uh, this farewell to Sartre and also gives, and she gives manuscripts of a trip and conversation she was having with Sartre just before he died, which is extremely powerful. And she spends a long time after Sartre passed away she, she curled up next to his body, for example, and just lay in his arms for, for hours after he died. And it's it's all very moving and very powerful. I'm getting upset, so we're going to move off from yeah, this point. Yeah, I think it's worth saying as well, we, we don't want to define the Beauvoir in relationship to a man in her relationship with Sartre, but it is worth saying that they had a very mutual relationship that it was it had so many different levels to it it was a romantic relationship it was an academic relationship where they were constantly there's a there's an argument of thought that all of their works since they met could be authored to both of them because they edited each other's work and gave each other notes and wrote extensive letters to each other um, about not just obviously about their personal relationship but also you know about their work so um, that's kind of rare in in philosophy and, and kind of academic thought there's not really like you could say like a power couple right so they're kind of like this celebrity kind of couple in France living this really alternative lifestyle writing all these works um, and they were extremely well thought of in France I mean John Paul Sartre's funeral was you know incredibly well attended mm. um, he was you know was 40,000 maybe yeah he, he, is, he is like a big deal and Simone de Beauvoir you know maybe you could argue not as um, important at the time of Sartre um, but certainly I think de Beauvoir's work even if it wasn't necessarily as recognised at the time is certainly being more recognised now mm. um, and I think that we don't want to define it in regards to Sartre but again Again, it was a very mutual relationship where they where they exchanged, um, you know, their information and their ideas, and I think that's a, that's a really nice thing as well. It's just really like just interesting to read about and to know. Yeah, it's a, it's a really interesting relationship, um, like complete mutual respect for one another in in about as many ways as you can possibly have. Um, I think that people like to focus on the sexual element of it because it's it's highly well just interesting, right? And it's, it's a bit of gossip, it's, Andy. Yeah, it's a bit of gossip. Everyone's uh, a bit of gossip, um, don't they? And they liked they liked the gossip and they liked to write to one another about uh, certain elements of their experience. What I found interesting, and I didn't actually know this until I was reading up on it, is that after knowing each other for roughly around 10 years, their, the sexual relationship they had actually stopped. So they were still just kind of like almost committed to each other purely in this friendship uh, and, and academically as well as personal. And that obviously... Like they they still remained to not fully live together, but they saw each other regularly. There was there was never a period in their life where they just went completely silent from one another. And I think the the older you get, the harder that is. Like it's even just from our own perspectives. When you leave university and you have like this group of friends, and then like even if you want to keep in touch with them the most, like you you don't always. Uh, and you there's the test of that relationship because most romantic relationships that they end. Most people don't hang around for decades later, do they? Mm. Um, so I, that's a really real big testament to, to that, uh, which I found uh, quite endearing. Uh, Ethics of Ambiguity, published 1947, Second Sex, 1949. Those are our two main texts for part two and part three. Um, I just wanted to give The Death of God as a last part, if that's okay. Just, the, you know, how, how she went on to abandon um, her Catholic faith. Um, so a couple of quotations, I'll keep them brief. 
again, really, really powerful stuff. And I can't recommend picking up memoirs of his beautiful daughter enough. Not sponsored by it. I about to say, you, you're getting close yeah. to that copyright limit <laughs> there, Jack. <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> Penguin, we love you. Thank you for, <laughs> <laughs> thank you for letting us steal from you. Uh, one evening, I was leaning as on so many other evenings out of my window. A warm fragrance was rising from the stables up to the star-sprinkled sky. My prayer rose half-heartedly and then fell back to earth. I spent my day eating forbidden apples and reading in a book of Balzac, also forbidden, the strange idyll of a young man and a panther before falling asleep. I was going to tell myself some queer old tales which would put me in a queer state of mind. These are sins, I told myself. It was impossible to deceive myself any longer. Deliberate disobedience, systematic lies, impure imaginings. Such conduct could hardly be described as innocent. And she goes on to say, you know, I no longer believe in God. She told herself this. She didn't feel like she was surprised. And describes the worldly pleasures around her in the garden and how, you know, she felt like it's, she loves being alive. She loves the world and all its pleasures. And she's not going to give up them for the sake of something which she doesn't even think is true. Um, we mentioned just before recording this is, I promise, hand on heart, and if I pick up the memoirs again, tell me to put it down. This is the last quotation I'm giving from the memoirs. I swear. Uh -huh. I swear on God's name, <laughs> the Almighty. I made another discovery one afternoon in Paris. This is when she's older. I realized that I was condemned to death. I was alone in the house and did not attempt to control my despair. I screamed and tore at the red carpet. And when dazed, I got myself to my feet again and asked myself, how do other people manage? How shall I manage too? It seemed to me impossible that I could live all through life with such horror gnawing at my heart. When the reckoning comes, I thought, when you're 30 or 40 and you think it'll be tomorrow, how on earth can you bear the thought? Even more than death itself, I feared that terror that would soon be with me always. So I think the quote here comes in that you realize she realized she was an atheist early on in her life, like a lot of atheists do. It's around uh, from psychology teachers in between 13 and 16. Most people make this conversion. And when later on in life, she's just walking through Paris and she's like, hold on, I'm an atheist. Crap. Like, <laughs> this is it. And, and she feels like this horror th flow through her. But she's been doing the nine till five for so long or working all the time, keeping herself occupied that it doesn't really seep in until you just take a moment to reflect. And then suddenly this horror fills over and she feels this rage. And then later on in the memoir, she's like, oh, now I'm back to it. I'm just back that, to doing work yeah. again. Yeah. And the horror goes. I think it's interesting that we've mentioned existentialism and these episodes are about it, but most people, when they hear the word existentialism, would probably think of an existential crisis, which is pretty much what someone would work yeah, just has explained. Yeah, that feels like that's what's going on yeah, there. Yeah, yeah. So she's having like a crisis of meaning and her own maybe insignificance in, in, in the world. And I think that's something that all people who kind of, you know, are into thinking in some some way have at some point like if you actually just take a step back and get off the get out of the rat race or off the hamster wheel for a second mm. and you go oh my god especially if you if you, you know if you do believe that there is no kind of divine reason or purpose to the universe then yeah that can be quite a scary thing um and you know that's when you know even if we look at that god is dead nietzsche quote it's not like a celebration like god is dead party poppers out you know it's 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 supposed to be kind of like a scary thing like, mm. a, like so so what now then where do we get our meaning from and we're going to look, obviously, at where Simone de Beauvoir thinks she, well, where people should get their meanings from. Because um, existentialism is, again, back to this idea that, you know, you can create your own meaning. You, you, you know, your existence precedes your essence, that you can develop your own meaning for yourself. Andrew, have you not put your phone on, son? Do you want to share that with the rest of the class? Uh, it was <laughs> nothing, Jack. It was God. <laughs> it was Speak God, up yeah. for me, please. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> Come on, Andrew. Yeah. Yeah. You got my back, haven't you? <laughs> Sorry, have you met me? <laughs> <laughs> Why are you having a conversation with God, Andy? I don't know. I'm just, I've lost Do you want my me mind. to just... That, that might be a nice way to end it. But. The Mystery Philosopher. So, I thought we'd play a new game, guys. Um, it's We've done 50 episodes. We've played philosophy quiz, pop-pop philosophy quiz. And Philosophical Ultimatum, those have been our two main games. But Philosophical Ultimatum is dead. Oh, no. Um, and we have killed it. Yeah. What sacred <laughs> games we have to invent? <laughs> the murder of all murderers. Um, well, we've invented a new game. We're going to trial it for this episode. So at the end of part one, part two, part three, um, I'm going to play you a quotation from a philosopher. Ooh. It's called Mystery Philosopher. Ooh, I like it. You both just get one guess at who it is. And then next installment, you get another guess. Third part, you'll get one. And if uh, you haven't so you got keep it, giving us part, more information. No, just give you the same clip. 
<laughs> is it more? Is it connected to what we're just this saying? whole clip? Is it connected to what we're Sorry, talking about? Sorry, it's the same clip. Yeah, I'll give you a clue if you. Yeah, it's just the right, same. But they're like, so if we don't get it right, we just take another stab. Yeah, you have to wait another hour and then you get another <laughs> okay. go. All right. Fair okay, enough. you ready? Go for it. Uh, I've distorted the philosopher's voice to make sure you don't get. <laughs> oh, so this is on a previous recording then. The most common mistake when taking on the challenge of reproducing sound is to forget that it is a human being that is subjectively going to judge whether or not the sound is high fidelity. What do you think? So that's wow. our mystery philosopher. I'm going to go Gregory Miller. Gregory Miller and Andy, so... what do you think? Would you like it again, Andy? <laughs> no. <Are> you sure? <laughs> The most common mistake when taking on the challenge of reproducing sound is to forget that it is a human being that is subjectively going to judge whether or not the sound is high fidelity. Who could it be? <laughs> God, I... You can tell that Jake's got some new equipment and he's been having yeah, a lot of fun playing with around with that. Uh, <laughs> God, it's it's one of those... Uh, oh, I'm going to go with... Uh, What's this? Come on, we're not. Uh, we don't have to. We haven't got ads to play or anything. We're not trying to drag this out for no reason. <laughs> I'm going to go Daniel Hill. You're both wrong. Oh, okay. uh, we'll right. play again we'll play next it. time. Yeah, sure. Yeah, sure. Good. Yeah, I enjoyed sure. that. Cool. Um, rather than we might play the outro after this, just a reminder before the jingle plays, head over to Patreon, patreon.com forward slash pansycast. Smash that Patreon. Support us, please. I've been watching too much YouTube. Um, <laughs> yes. Please pick up a jumper. Pick up the merch. It's the pansycast.com forward slash sweatshirts. Um, never again. Never never again what? N never say smash that or <laughs> anything or merch, please. <laughs> Thank you for joining us for another episode of the Pan Sai Cast. The next instalment of this episode will be available on the following Monday. Patreon subscribers already have access to the latest episode of the Pan Sai Cast. To support the show and get early access to all of the episodes, you can visit us on Patreon. That's www.patreon.com forward slash Pan The link is also in the iTunes description. For all the reading and to find out more about the show and get all of the old episodes completely free, you can visit www.thepansycast.com. From all of us here at The Pansycast, thank you for your support and thank you for listening. Thank you for listening. Thank you for listening. Thank you very much. It's been lots of fun. Thank you for listening. Thank you for listening. Thank you very much for having me. Thank you for listening. Thank you for listening. It's been a pleasure. Thank you for listening. Thank you all. I've enjoyed it a lot. Thanks a lot. You're very welcome. Thank you. Thank you. Goodbye. Goodbye. I really appreciate what you folks are trying to do. That's that was that great. Was that was really good. Great. You guys really read up on this. Yeah, it was good. Wow. <laughs> that was a lot of fun. You guys uh, managed to combine the banter and the philosophy perfectly, I think. Beautiful. Fantastic. Oh, well done, you guys. Gosh, you're doing a wonderful thing with this. <laughs>